Saturday night edition of the Anaheim Calling Podcast. The Ducks are now 2-0 and after defeating the San Jose Sharks 3-1 to at Honda Center tonight. Jake is here with me to break it all down. You who were you who was basically our sideline reporter tonight. I was out the, the line combination. Was I was I the, the first reporters? Was I the first person to break that? I actually was in there. I was like, I don't know because I saw a bunch of there was a bunch of chatter pregame about what was happening with the lines and the fact mm-hmm. that Nick Ritchie wasn't in, the fact that Shore may be centering a line and a whole lot of mm-hmm. different things. And I was like, huh, I'm curious what the line rushes are looking like. I had no idea if anyone else had tweeted tweeted out yet. I was like, yeah. Screw it. Let's throw this out there. We need to start a new uh, new hashtag. Hashtag Rudolph first. Hashtag Rudolph first. Make, um, make a Twitter handle for uh, breaking news. <laughs> well, on that note, actually, that's a good place to start before we actually get into the game recap. So before the game, it was announced that Sam Steele was still dealing with the injury that sidelined him for most of the preseason. And this is the latest I've ever seen a call up get announced. I believe it was 6.44 p.m., so 16 minutes before game time, the Ducks tweeted out that Isaac Lindstrom had been called up from San Diego um, and that he would be in the lineup. (laughs) And so if it was tweeted that late, it means that, of course, it happened much, much earlier than that. Um, Also, Nick Ritchie, a healthy scratch tonight, which... I found a little surprising only because I thought Richie had a fine game against Arizona on Thursday. Did you make anything of that, that uh, Nick Richie wasn't in the lineup tonight? I mean, it's clear that I don't think he was listed as a, as being injured. So it was a healthy Mm -hmm. scratch. So I think we have to take something away from it that maybe Dallas Akins wasn't too happy with his performance in that game. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know if we talked about Richie that much, but what were your thoughts on his on his game in Arizona? Because I think it's an important thing to hit on if he was scratched for this game. Did you think that uh, his performance against Arizona warranted him being scratched? No, I thought he was fine. I thought he had Same. a good game. I mean, maybe you could say that the, the penalty or the almost penalty was something that Dallas Akins uh, did not want to reward with another appearance in the lineup. I mean, that's all I can really think of because – Dallas Akins has talked about how he wants to keep guys, make sure guys stay out of the box this season, which I'm sure is music to Ducks fans' ears yeah. after the, the penalty-ridden years under Ooh. Carlisle. Let me throw out this idea. What if it's a fact of, well, Devin Shore had a pretty solid game. He created the goal for Derek Grant with that, the the rush into the zone, and created a couple good chances for himself. Um, and... Uh, the fact that he wanted to get maybe Akins wanted to get Delorier into the lineup also, so it just so happened that Nick Ritchie was the the casualty of that left hand side as compared to a Max Jones. So maybe that's the case, and maybe it's not so much an indictment of Ritchie playing poor as it is an indictment mm-hmm. of they wanted to get Delorier into the game and Ritchie out of the the other left wingers was the odd man out. Yeah, I think it was more of a musical chairs thing that they just wanted to give Deloria a look. And because Shore had been playing well, they weren't going to take him out. And so maybe what this hints at is that um, that the one rotating spot is going to be between Deloria, Richie, and maybe Shore. Um, because I think Max Jones, he's on the team because the franchise or the organization wants to find out what's where he's at in his development. And He's getting pretty good time um, in meaningful minutes. And so I don't – it seems like Nick Ritchie's role is a little reduced, or at least he's not just a mainstay in the lineup. I don't – I can't think of too many times, and obviously I'd have to go back and check that he was a healthy scratch under Randy Carlisle. He was kind of a fixture in the lineup. Yeah. So this is is new. This is new uncharted territory. But, again, as will be the theme of this podcast, it's so early that it's hard to really know for sure – on the topic of Nick Delorier, though, what did you think of his game tonight? Since we can probably keep this pretty brief, what did you think of his game? I thought he was fine. I mean, let's... Not- notably dropped the gloves against Brendan Dillon. Yeah, and had a, a, quite pretty, well. a pretty good fight there. Uh, mm-hmm. If you're looking at his on-ice numbers, they're, they're really not pretty. He got hemmed in his own zone a couple times. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean... that line, that, that line of, of Grant, Delorier, and Rowney was not good tonight, mm-hmm. and it was a pretty stark departure from what we saw from the fourth line last game, which 
was why maybe it was a little surprising to see Richie get scratched because that line did have a good performance. And Nick Delorier, I'm going to, I don't know how often I'll try to stay away from referring to this, but Nick Delorier really struggled for the Canadians last year. And one of the big, one of the big drawbacks of that team last season was that they couldn't trust their fourth line. And it just so happened that Nick Delorier was a big part of that until they stopped putting him out there. And so we talked about how that trade was a little questionable at the time. And although of course it didn't really cost the, the ducks anything tonight, I don't know how much more, how, I don't know how frequently we'll see him in the lineup this season, but there's so many positives to take away from this game. And we should yeah. definitely jump into we, them here. So what, why don't we, mm-hmm. before we jump in though, let, let's also make mention as people in our Twitch chat are, are stating a wild Michael Del Zotto appeared tonight. Yeah. Also another thing to mention, Michael Del Zotto, drawing in in place of Corbinian Holzer. And another kind of odd thing, just because Holzer and Larson had a pretty good first game, but I think this is just Dallas Aikens trying stuff, just seeing how different guys react to different situations. Um, any thoughts on Dalzado's game tonight? I mean, he he did score the first goal of the game he, he, off of an off of an Arundel turnover. What did you think of that? He scored the first goal of the game um, due to the fact that it wasn't just that... Uh, I mean, he had a wide open net to score on, so he should put that in. But that goal happens because he pinched up high in the zone, or not high in the zone, pinched down into the zone and really joined the rush. And that's something that over the first two games, and we can get into this more as we get into the recap and get in the post game. but something I've noticed specifically with this Ducks team is that the the D-men have full... uh, the full uh, confidence of the coaching staff to be able to uh, jump into the offensive zone and really join the rush. And the fact that he was at the face-off dots, basically, by the time Kasha got that puck, allowed him to be able to get there and put the puck in the net. So it, it's definitely one of those things where the goal happens because of the system. I think overall, you look at his numbers on the night, um, 36%, Corsi 4 percentage. You're looking at, uh, let me just try to find his expected goals numbers really quickly, but 20 uh, or 40% expected goals. So not exactly fantastic on the night from that pair. I believe that Holzer was a bit better last game, but then again, I think that the Sharks are a much better team than the Coyotes are. Yeah, so let's let's get into the recap here since this goal did occur so early in the game, uh, not even five minutes into the game. The Ducks are able to recover the puck in their own defensive zone. Ryan Getzlaff actually wins a battle, or sorry, Andre Kasha wins a battle at the point, and then Ryan Getzlaff recovers it. Getzlaff, by the way, who had a, I thought had a really strong performance tonight. Mm-hmm. Uh, Getzlaff skates it down the rink and realizes he's probably not going to beat uh, his defenders with speed, so he just circles back and then dumps it in down low. Aaron Dell, the Sharks goaltender, stops it behind the net and makes a really questionable decision trying to rim it back to Brendan Dillon when Andre Kasha is clearly um, clearly right there to stop it. Now, here's here's actually where I would buy that this, is, this goal partly happened because of the system. I don't know... It's hard to tell if Arendell really looked both ways before crossing here, quote unquote. But Michael Delzato was covering the side of the boards. So Arendell didn't have the option to rim it up the boards. And so his only real option would have been to try to get it over to Dylan or leave it to one of his other skaters. But because there was because Delzato was pressuring on that board side, it really left Del with it really left Dell with no options. And so Kasha is able to just get the puck there, intercepts it really cleanly, and then Dalzato, realizing that his teammate has gotten the puck, pinches in down low and then scores into the empty net. So he wasn't really just hanging out in the slot. No, 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 no. He, he, he saw it develop, but what did help Kasha make this play is that Dalzato was cutting off an option for Dell. And so definitely, though, I will agree with you that in this new – in this – very small sample that we have. Yeah. The Ducks defensemen have been really aggressive in a jo- joining the play, for checking even. And so I think that that, that really can, can just wreak havoc on the opposition because there are times where throughout this game, the, the Sharks just look so flustered by the way that the, the Ducks were pressuring them that it's a bit of a high risk, high reward. You know, we've seen it now. Um, we saw it especially against Arizona in game one where the Ducks got caught a couple times with stretch passes. Yeah. But it is, if you get the right team on the right night, you can get moments in a game, especially like we saw in the second period where 
the Ducks just absolutely dominated. Yeah, and I it's not necessarily even getting I mean, the biggest thing when you have your defenseman pitching in like that is you're trying to create offense for yourself. And in order to have the defense doing that, you need a couple things. You need your forwards to have buy-in and awareness so that if your defenseman's in on the rush, and I think there was at one point in the first period where uh, the Ducks broke into the zone, Jacob Silverberg had the stick on or puck on his stick, and he feeds it to a guy in the middle of the ice. And at first glance, I thought it was Raquel. And then I noticed, oh, wait, that person turning that just shot the puck was uh, Brendan Gooley. And... So when Brendan Gooley jumps up and is in the play like that, then you need, you want to get a four-man rush going. But once you kind of see that the puck might turn over, you need a forward to buy in if the the defenseman's down low to get back and cover. And so it, it's a system that is very good if you can play it correctly. And part of that is having guys that can cover for you, having guys that are skating. There needs to be constant movement. It needs to be high energy. And this kind of goes back to... I don't know if you remember this, but when Dallas Aikens first was hired and had that uh, that interview and they had that whole big special and everything, he said he wants the Ducks to be a team that's hard to play against. And by being hard to play against, it doesn't necessarily mean um, getting in and hitting guys. Because I don't think there were a whole lot of body checks overall in tonight's game. That wasn't necessarily something that the Ducks were trying to do throughout the game. There were a couple late here and there and trying to set some physical tones, but not a whole lot. And by being hard to play against, Aikens more so was saying, you can be hard to play against by being physical. You can also be hard to play against by attacking with speed. You can be hard to play against by uh, having a lot of skill. All of those different ways are being hard to play against. And that's the first thing that kind of jumps into my mind with seeing the Ducks play this way is they're hitting you in the transition game. They're forcing the other team to skate back and not only the center and the two defensemen, but if you have four guys jumping in on the rush, then you have to have a winger also covering back. And so there's a whole lot going on there and it makes a whole lot of confusion and create and can create a whole lot of chances going your way. Yeah, absolutely. There's there. You're right that there was not a whole lot of just straight up body checks tonight. Nick Delorier did have a pretty solid one on Eric Carlson. Other notes here in the first period, I thought that the first period, especially Troy Terry looked really good. He had a couple of rushes up the ice where he just looked fast. I don't know how else. I don't have a a real uh, polished way of putting that. He just looked fast. He was trying moves at center ice that, I mean, I don't don't want to keep doing this, but he was trying deeks at center ice that I don't know if he would have, been encouraged to make them a year ago yeah uh, because obviously if you turn it over at center ice uh, you can get into quite a bit of trouble going the other way but he was just trying stuff very creative and even in the first period where the ducks were on the power play i thought that him and raquel seemed to have some nice chemistry a lot of cross cross ice passing raquel being in that left face off dot as a on his off wing as a one-timer option and then troy terry on his strong side in the right face off dot so Outside of the DeLaurier fight in the first period, I really thought that Troy Terry stood out in a positive way in that opening frame. And although the Ducks, if you just look at the numbers, they didn't really control play. They got outshot attempted in the first period. It was a lot more even, and it felt a lot less just all over the place than it did against Arizona. Yeah, well, I mean, you look at the first period, even though, yes, the shot attempts were 11 for 20 against, so they uh... 35% Corsi 4 percentage. If you look at the quality of those chances, none of the, the Sharks' chances were in a high uh, high danger area. If you look at expected goals, it's pretty close to even at 0.38 to 0.42. So if you're looking at it, yes, the Sharks had more shot attempts. But if you're looking at the quality of those chances, it's pretty even for that first period. And when you factor in the power play, it gets even more so a little bit skewed in the Ducks' favor with adding in a fair amount of expected goals at .99 uh, to .42. So the Ducks actually had a kind of looking at that really quickly. So in that first period, like I said, they in all situations, .99 expected goals for. And then when you bump it down to uh, 5 on 5, .38. So on their one power play, they had some really high danger chances and were able to get a fair amount of um, high quality looks uh, equating to around a point about a half expected goal. So they had a, with all their chances, about a 50% chance of scoring on that power play. Yeah. Moving up here to the second period. So this was the period where the ducks really uh, dominated overall 
pretty much every facet of the game. However, they just weren't able to put any behind Aaron Dell early in that middle frame, and the Sharks would actually tie the game up. And outside of maybe a 10-minute stretch in the third period, this was probably the only time where the Sharks really stood out. Um, and this play, it wasn't really the result of anything that the Ducks did all that wrong. It was just an elite play uh, mm-hmm. by two really skilled guys. And so as the Sharks are able to enter the zone against Anaheim, it comes back to the point to Eric Carlson, um, who makes a really smart play, just fakes the slap shot to distract his defender or basically open him up. And then instead of actually shooting it, he passes it over to Logan Couture, who then has a bunch of room in the middle of the ice and just roofs it on John Gibson. So not a, not a whole lot that John Gibson can do there. And honestly, not a whole lot that really anyone can do there because I thought that that was just better offense. Just did not. Yeah. Sometimes you just you just can't defend against uh, yep. against things like that. But just a minute later, or just a couple minutes later, the Ducks would strike back, and this is when they were really turning it on, getting a whole lot of chances. Just like we were talking about earlier, this up tempo style where you're you're trying to move the puck up the ice as quickly as possible. There can be periods in a game where it, it looks like you've broken it wide open. And and this was really, uh, I would say, uh, the best example of that. The Ducks waste no time getting out of their zone. It goes up to Andre Kasha in the neutral zone, who then just makes a move to the middle. Ryan Getzlaff recognizes that there's space available to him. I think the Sharks may have been changing here. Kasha just gets it up to Getzlaff, and he's got an unopposed lane to the Sharks net. And again, like Ryan Getzlaff, not known for speed, definitely has probably lost a step in the last couple of years. But on this play, he he doesn't look all that slow. He comes in, darts to the net, beats Brent Burns to the spot, and then just puts on a shot fake. And then as he's making that fake, goes over to his forehand and tucks it in as he's falling to the ice. So that was some... uh, that was some vintage Ryan Getzloff yeah. there. What did you make of that goal? Because that was pretty highlight reel. Yeah, play. it's definitely. This is the second game in a row for the Ducks where there's a highlight reel goal. Um, that's a play, though. It, it's interesting because you look at it. On the whole, Ryan Getzloff's not a guy that you would say is fast. He, he's not a fast player. And so you're looking at a system that's meant to play fast. It's kind of one of those things you instantly, he stands out. But I've said this a couple, I think a couple times over the past years. Playing fast, you don't necessarily have to actually have fast players to do it. You just have to be able to move the puck quickly and be able to hit guys in full speed and full stride. And that's one of the things that happened on this play. Andre Kasha got the puck, and Getzloff was already at full speed in the neutral zone. And so he hits Getzloff. Getzloff has full speed as the defenseman is a little bit flat-footed. So even though Getzloff isn't the most fleet of foot, Getzloff at full speed is still going to be faster than a defenseman flat-footed, having a transition and pivot to go backwards. Getzloff was able to go and get in on the, or get in and end up scoring. And it's a great move. And yeah, I, it, it's one of those that it, that was kind of like my, uh, wow moment for me with this team that it was when the Sharks scored, I, I kind of had this moment and this realization of being like, okay, maybe the Sharks end up, uh, the Sharks might end up kind of controlling play here. This is a, a team that's very good. Um, this is going to be the test for the Ducks to see how they can really handle it. And the Sharks scored. I thought that maybe they may try to control some of the play. And then the Ducks hit back with that goal instantly. And that is such an important thing because that goal from the Sharks could have started to be the downturn for the Ducks with building momentum, gaining all that, getting chances, everything. And the Ducks being able to answer right back with a goal of their own is, uh, is very, very important for this game. And I think very important for the psyche and kind of shows you the type of uh, team that this uh, Ducks team currently is. Absolutely. So on the other side of our first break here, we're going to get into the rest of the second period as well as finishing out our game recap before we get into some big picture stuff. Okay, back from the first break. So let's wrap up or let's uh, continue on with this second period. So a couple notes that I wanted to add in before um, the Getzlaff goal occurred. So John Gibson had to make a really tough save early in that second period. Had to stretch out the left pad, basically just barely got his toe on it. And so, like you said earlier, um, there were definitely moments in that second where it could have swung back to the the Sharks' favor, and the the Ducks just managed to 
hold that line and not give the Sharks any anything to really work with. Um, I also thought that during the second period, Isaac Lindstrom, among all of the great things that happened in that second period, Isaac Lindstrom had some really nice moments. Early in the second, he had a nice centering fee to Michael Delzato once again in the slot off the rush. That was really nice. Lindstrom also had a really nice give and go play with Ricard Raquel, where he he floated a, a saucer pass up the ice that Raquel was able to control. Raquel then goes back to him and Lindstrom nearly put it away. But really throughout the rest of that second period, the, the Ducks were just so dominant and it just, it felt like the, even though the score was not necessarily reflecting it at that point, they're only up two one before we get into the Henrique goal here. It felt like the Ducks just could do no wrong. They had so many great A opportunities. Aaron Dell nearly coughed up another one, just passing it directly to Adam Henrique. I believe uh, Troy Terry had some, real nice opportunities. It, it just felt like everything was clicking in a way that we quite frankly have not seen from this team, um, at least in this iteration of this roster. And even going back to a few years now, they, they were playing with such pace and such confidence with the puck that, you know, we'll, we'll get into some reasons why we don't want to fully buy into that. But that second period was some of the best hockey I've seen played at Honda center by the home team in a while. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where the end of that second period, it was kind of like a, a pinch me moment. I don't know if I've seen the Ducks ever play like this in my history of being a fan. They've had some great teams. They've had some really great coaches. They've had some fun teams. Um, but I don't know if I've ever been as entertained as I was in that period and seen them play that style of game. And I think that's the most important part because it wasn't just the transition. It wasn't just getting the chances because there's been some dominant periods from the Stucks team in the past. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if uh, I've ever seen them hit in the way that they have on the counterattack and hit in the transition. Um, and it, it, it's just, it was so much fun to watch. And at one point in time in that second period, there was a five on two rush. Yeah, that was <laughs> – and they didn't score, and they didn't, they didn't honestly get a great look out of it. But that's that just goes to show how – and this is something that I would be curious to look into more as the season goes along. But when you're watching this Ducks team, one thing to really make a note of is that they, they play really close together. There's not a whole lot of spread out play where guys are waiting for the pass on the other side of the ice or waiting for a stretch pass – the guys are constantly moving as a group and what that makes for is really quick, just short transition yeah. plays that otherwise it, it's harder to play that style because if you don't have puck support, then teams are going to pick off passes and you're just going to spend a lot of energy skating it out. And so look for that next time. If, if you watch any time the puck is on a certain side of the boards, there's always at least three or even four black or as it was tonight, orange jerseys, um, really pressuring that that strong side and yeah that's that's not something that we've seen in the past and that is a style that can be tough to, to really I would say maintain over a season but when it's clicking it's really clicking yeah and I mean two things on that real quick I want to go back to that five on two rush um <laughs> I love seeing that personally because there are going to be plenty of people out there that said well they didn't score and if you don't score that, or you're going to leave yourself open to 3 on 0 then going the other way. Here's the thing, though. That's not really how that works, but yes. <laughs> yeah, but if that is how it works, you have a 5 on 2 rush. Put the puck in the back of the net, then you don't have an odd man rush going the other way. Mm -hmm. Like how many? And so that's one of those things where it, it's all about risk man or not risk management, but assessing what the risk is. And the chance of you scoring on a 5 on 2 is so high. Take advantage of that. Get up there, get in the play. And then kind of with you saying about the the uh, kind of the, the gap control and all that different type of stuff with the team, the thing I noticed, and I, I made mention, I go to games with my dad, and I was talking to him about this. It was noticeable in that period that they were playing as five-man units. It wasn't a, exactly. a distinct difference between the forwards and the defense. And this is something that going back to the, the Soviet Union teams, if you watch any documentaries about them, the things that they did so great and kind of this transition when a lot of the guys came to the NHL specifically um, when they were all with the Red Wings with the Russian five was that they played as a five man unit. And so 
There was constant puck movement, constant player movement, and it really just caused a lot of confusion. And that's kind of what this reminded me of a bit in the sense of all five players were in on it. All five players were working together. And now I'm not going to say they were on the level of the Russian Five or anything like that. <laughs> I was going to say, two games into the season, Jake is covering the not, Ducks to the Red Army. Like team. I said, not <laughs> making the actual comparison, but I'm using that as an example for fans. Let yeah, me have it. No, I, we no, had to deal with Randy Carlisle last year. Let's at po- least have some fun. Your point is well taken. I just had to... I just had to point that out. Uh, no, but that but the thing is, is this is actually how a lot of teams are playing in today's NHL. The exactly. game is getting faster and faster and faster. And like you said, it's not the the forward roles are not as delineated, as strictly delineated as they used to be. Now it's like you hear all the time it's F one, F two, and F three, as opposed to left wing, center, and right wing. And those roles that one through three role is interchangeable depending on the situation. And that seems to be the way they're playing. Again, we have a such a small sample to work with here. Now, yeah. just to look at some numbers from that second period. So the Ducks defensive game, in terms of just the quality of looks that they allowed, it didn't really change a whole lot. The expected goals at five on five went from 0.42 for San Jose in the first to 0.44 in the second period. But the goals for the expected goals for jumped up like crazy. It went from 0.38 for the Ducks in the first to one. So <laughs> that's a pretty drastic jump of 0.62. And the Ducks went from six scoring chances for in the first period to 18. So they were just all over the Sharks. And I think that this is a theme that maybe we're going to see as the season mm-hmm. progresses is that this is going to be a high event team. They're still allowing chances. They're yeah. still there's still a decent amount of shots coming their way. I mean, the shot total was still above 30 for both teams. And it's not as if the ducks really shut down the sharks tonight, but they play at such a high tempo that they're going to get a lot of looks. And by sheer volume, they're bound to just put a few behind the the goalie that night. And, and I don't, that's kind of, I don't actually think that's an awful strategy when you have John Gibson in net. Well, it's also just not awful when you have this kind of team where, yeah, you don't really have the kind of roster where you can shut other teams down, but you do have the kind of roster where you have enough talent sprinkled throughout the lineup where if you're just telling the guys to move forward and look to make plays, there are guys on this roster who can make plays. I mean, ultimately the Ducks tonight were outshot, 36-33, but if you look at the quality of the chances on both sides, it, it doesn't really well, compare. You look at the quality and then you also factor in the fa- or factor in that there were four power plays for the Sharks as compared to one for the Ducks, or sorry, two yeah. for the Ducks. That also factors into, and that's just for those of you out there, why we typically look at five on five with terms of sh- in terms of shot attempts and in terms of uh, quality chances and expected goals. The reason for doing that is power plays can skew a lot of things. And so, yes, power plays, penalty kills are an important part of the game. But if you're trying to look at the game flow and get a feel for the actual game, they kind of skew things one way or the other hard, especially when they're not even. And so if you were to look at, for instance, shots on goal on the night, what, what were the shots on goal in all situations again? Well, so, I mean, you're right about that, but the, sh- the, the shots on goal were 30, 36, 33 uh, in favor of San Jose, but the shot attempts at five on five were even. Yeah. They were and, 46, 46 no, I, yeah, on the night. I know. Mm-hmm. And shot attempt and shots on goal at five on five were also even at 20, even at 24, 24. Yeah, but it's the scoring chances. It's the quality yes, that's just agreed. so lopsided in the Ducks' favor. I mean, 31 to 20 scoring chances and then 1.8 to 1.3 in terms of expected goals at five on five and then seven to five high danger chances so the ducks just ran away with shot quality and their third goal of the night with just a minute left in the first period was really a great example of that the ducks again just controlling in the shark zone getting shots on net at will the sharks doing everything they can to just get out of their zone maybe on some tired legs here tomas hurdle turns it over at center ice, but it's almost through no fault of his own because there's three duck skaters around him before he even hits the red line. That's the kind of pressure that you, that you see this ducks team employ at times. The puck quickly turns over. Adam Henrique just gets on his horse, skates it down the left wing. And Kevin LeBanc basically just gives up on this play. This is probably one of the worst back checks you'll ever see. But that being said, it is also of a product. It is also a product of the fact that the ducks had the sharks, that sharks unit hemmed into their zone for a, a good bit there. And so Adam Henrique rewarded for his hard work. It's a clear lane to the net and then just cuts to his backhand and roofs the backhand 
top right on Aaron Dell. That makes it three to one. You see the Brendan Dillon smashing his stick on the, the crossbar, which is always a, you know, when teams are getting blown out, when they're getting outplayed, that's always kind of a sign of, all right, they've reached a breaking point. That would make it three to one. No further goals on the night in the third period. I thought that in the third period, the, the Ducks clearly, I, won't, I don't want to say they sat back because I think the Sharks were just not going to get embarrassed. I think that they, you know, especially after getting blown out against Vegas uh, last night on Friday night, I think that they just were, told themselves, okay, we, we can't let this one they just were, totally get off the rails. They were also probably um, gassed. Exactly. Yeah. And so anyway, so the, the, the third period, there was not really quite as much to write home about. I thought that the, the Ducks did well to just, again, like we talked about on Thursday against Arizona, the, the Ducks did well not to just sit back and, and turtle and, and wait for the game to come to them. They still managed a good pace, and they pull it out, 3-1 to one victory. So, I mean, there's so many different ways we can go from go from here, but what are some of your overall impressions or maybe performances individual or lines or anything like that that you want to point out here um i think that overall performances are over let's start with big big uh big picture takeaway i have not left a game feeling that way in a long time did you feel warm and fuzzy i didn't know what to say i don't know how i'm talking right now we do a podcast we we do a pod yeah i am my favorite team the team I've cheered for. They, the team they that, look good. They, It's not just that they look good. It's that they play fun. And they that's, play fun. They, yes. Let, let's I'm play sure fun. one of our English teacher listeners, Bonnie. Uh, Bonnie's going to hate me. Bonnie's <laughs> going to hate me. Um, no, they, they play good. They're playing they play an entertaining good. brand of hockey. And mm-hmm. it, it's one of those things where this is an organization that at times has been a relic of the past and the past uh, styles of play. And... It's it's weird to see them playing, and Erica's XO in our Twitch chat says they gave us hope, and I think that that's the best way to put it. Is that all of that kind of optimism and hope I had going into the season that potentially could be uh, misled a little bit and not be the case completely. This almost feels like the payoff for that. Well, definitely, I think that at this point we we don't want to jump too far Agreed. ahead and, and call this team a playoff team or whatever. Cause I think that if you look at the way that they play, there's clearly, you could see ways in which it can not work in some games where may, maybe you're going to just get into a shootout and that, and, you know, meaning high scoring game. And in that night, it just doesn't work out for you. And the way that they're, what that they play, although it's very encouraging, it also, I feel better about my prediction for this season that they're going to have some really high points of the season where they look really good. And then on the flip side, because it's such an aggressive game that there may be also some, some, some serious lulls, just kind of an up and down team. Yeah. But if nothing else, it's an entertaining product. And I think that that's what you're getting at and what I'm going to agree with. Some things that I did want to point out once again, game number two of the season, Brendan Gooley and Cam Fowler had really good numbers together they looked good. They were involved offensively. Like you mentioned, Brendan Gooley had one nice drive to the net on his backhand. So it's interesting because this is the only trend I can really feel confident in so far is that Lindholm and Manson are clearly still the matchup pairing. Tonight they were matched up almost exclusively against the uh, Timo Myers line. And although they didn't really crush it in those minutes, that allowed Brendan Gooley and Camp Fowler to kind of thrive away from that, that top unit. And that's exactly what happened. And that's yeah. exactly what they did in game one. And I think that that's a sound strategy because there will be nights where Lindholm and Manson do shut down that top line and then Gouleen Fowler can still go to work or it can be vice versa. And like we talked about before the season in our previews, if this can continue, if Brendan Gouleen and Cam Fowler can be this good together, that is such a huge, yes. huge win for the Ducks because if you look at last year, one thing that really killed the Ducks is that they, they had one defense pairing. And with all the injuries, that didn't help either. But they really had no depth on the blue line. And it really took uh, a trade for from sending Montour over to Buffalo in exchange for Brendan Gooley to, to correct that. It also took a coaching change. But the point being, 
this is a huge departure from what we saw in An- in, in Anaheim last season. Oh, com- completely. And I mean, so for those of you watching the live stream of this, I have the natural stat trick uh, game page up. And so you can see some of the numbers for the, the players on the night. Right now, it's filtered by expected goals for percentage. And so, yeah, uh, Brendan Gooley and Cam Fowler were the best pair. At expected goals for percentage, uh, Hampus Lentholm and Josh Manson were about 50% on the night. But they're going up against top competition, so it, it's a little bit different to compare them to anyone else. Um, and so I think that the fowler Gooley pairing, I mean, if they can be good, that could be a game-changer for this Ducks team. I, I think that that is an actual game changer for this team because, like you said, it gives them two legit D pairings. And then that third pairing can be kind of whatever it needs to be and mold. And I think Jacob Larson looked pretty good tonight. Numbers aren't great, but I think he, he looks like he's going to be serviceable in that third pairing role with whoever they want to pair him with. Um, one thing I did want to make mention of because Ken Paff, who, uh, a.k.a. Tony in our Twitch chat, did make mention that the Ducks were 3-0 to start last year. <laughs> the difference, the difference is that three and zero was a lot of smoke and mirrors. If you remember that first game against the Sharks last year, I think they were outshot like forty to twenty or something along yeah, those lines. Yeah, that, that game against the Sharks, I actually I was watching the game with uh, with the buddy, and I was saying this game has nothing to do with the game they played against the Sharks last season to start Completely. the year in San Jose. It was just a totally different team. It looked. They looked awful that game, and and I remember that distinctly because we talked about it after. That was the game where Tomas Hurdle just dangled Cam Fowler into oblivion off the rush. It was just not a good night for the Ducks, even though... Did they even win that game? The Ducks? Yes, the Ducks won that game. They, so even though they won, I mean, the Ducks could have lost tonight, and I think there would have still been a sense of optimism. Yes. That game, though, going back to last year, was just the complete opposite, and that's that's what you want. Ultimately, yes, results do matter and you are judged by your results but the process is what gets you to the results and it it all it is also what allows you to maintain those results whereas the ducks in the last three years have achieved results in an unsustainable way and you kind of saw that come undone last year or you did see that come undone last year obviously injuries played a role but we all kind of knew that at some point what they had built was going to come undone And now this year, the way that they're building it, I'm not ready to say this is a a real sound process that's going to last, that's going to stand the test of time. But you, you can see already how it's a little more sustainable. John Gibson has had to be good in both of these first games, but he hasn't had to be what he was last year, which was great, which was Hall of Fame level, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, He, he, he was good. He made some great saves, but we still haven't really had the, the big John Gibson save or moment yet this season. And I think that if you're a Ducks fan, you, you probably prefer it that way because the team is is 2-0 and and they haven't really needed John Gibson to, to be at a Vezina level. One thing I noticed last game, and I don't know if I noticed it as much this game, but I'm curious for your opinion on this before we get into our mm-hmm. second break. Um, mm-hmm. John Gibson seems to be playing the puck more. Noticeably so. Um. So you watched the game. You were at the game tonight, right? Yeah. So tonight so, I may so not have it, been able it, to perceive it, it as much. It, well, it's funny because John Allers was uh, was talking about that on on the broadcast, and he was saying that it's noticeable. And uh, I, I did. I maybe I just haven't noticed it. I don't know. I mean, he's he's always been kind of just like a decent puck handler. Started off a little rough in his career, and then kind of be, became a guy who kept it simple, made short passes. Yeah. So. I haven't really seen that quite a bit as much. I also am just my philosophy with goalies and puck handling is that unless you're one of the very best, you probably should just do it as little as possible Mm -hmm. because usually anyway, I could go on this whole tirade, but we do have a second break to get into here. So why don't we do that? And then on the other side, we are going to get into some final thoughts and then some listener questions. Okay, all done with the breaks for the episode here. So one thing I did want to talk about with John Gibson's puck handling is that there was a time, you go back 10, 15 years, where a great puck handling goalie could actually make a pretty big difference because defensemen were not as good of passers back then. They were not as good of puck movers, whereas in today's NHL, it's almost the rule is that you're going to be a good puck mover if you're uh, an everyday defenseman. Before, that was not really the case. You had pairings where you had one guy who was more of a 
stay at home physical guy and then another guy who is more of the offensively inclined blue liner. That's not really the case anymore. Everyone is a good puck mover. And so if you're a goalie that's coming out to make plays, your best bet is just to leave it to those guys because those guys are really good. The advantage of a puck moving goalie is just not, in my opinion, not what it used to be. And so, I mean, it's all fine and dandy that Gibson has improved in that regard, but I just, I see that as kind of a, an inefficiency that goalies are still trying to be that. I mean, every time I see Mike Smith come out, I just cringe because it's, I just think how <laughs> pointless it is. But I, that's just my Mike Smith vendetta. I mean, if they, all it is. if they can play it well and lead to breakouts against, it's going to be very beneficial for the team long term. That's just the kind problem of is that the, the problem is that goalies, a lot of goalies will look to make a pass just because they can. And I go, oh, I'm going to skip it ahead to this guy as opposed to getting it over to the, the nearest option along the boards. And that's, although it looks better from the goalie's perspective, it looks like he made a, a nice play. The, the problem is that breakouts today are so, there's so much system behind it. There, it's not a freewheeling type of operation. And so when you skip a step in the breakout, you're kind of breaking the process. And so a guy will get it along the boards and he's already being pressured. He doesn't really know what to do with it because that's not how they've drawn it up. So anyway, I'm just opposed to strong puck moving goalies, except for Carey Price, of course. Of course, of, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, really quickly before we wrap up and go into questions, I did want to give some final numbers on the night. Um, so shot attempts were completely even at 50% for the Ducks, uh, or 46. Shot attempts for 46 against. Final scoring chance numbers were 31-4, 20 against. Final expected goal number on the night. This is all at 5-on-5. Five five. We're at 1.82 to 1.39. And I do want to make mention, because I think expected goals at all situations has some value because it tells you a little bit if one team got a well, bit lucky. Well, it tells lucky. you how the game went. It, it tells you how the game went, Tell you tells you if one of the teams got a bit lucky uh, in terms of penalty killing, different things like that with where chances were coming from. So in all situations, expected goals were 3.26 to 2.82. So essentially the Ducks got some good penalty killing, uh, good uh, goaltending from John Gibson to be able to keep the the Sharks to only one goal. Another performance that I do want to point out tonight, even though the numbers don't really bear it out, Troy Terry had a really good game, Jake. He did? Hey, the numbers do bear it out tonight. Well, I mean, 60... I, I just don't to, – to me, even if the numbers look good, I just want to highlight specifically how he did achieve that. Okay. I just thought, again, building off of that first game, he, he, he was just very creative with the puck. He was very confident making plays in open ice along the wall. He had one really nice chance on his backhand that actually almost beat Arendelle. Yeah. Arendelle made a really nice save on that play. And his foot speed just seems to be improved. This is something that people talked about in previous years that his speed was a strong suit. And I never really saw him in that way. It just didn't seem like that was the strength of his game. It seems to me though, that he has worked on that over the summer because he is noticeably faster Yeah. or maybe he's just being encouraged to use it. Who knows? Maybe it's both, but I do think that he is looking more and more to me, like a legit top nine guy who maybe isn't quite ready yet to be, um, on a, on a first line, getting the toughest matchups, but he's every game now that we've seen so far, he's at least making one or two plays that have you kind of raising an eyebrow thinking, Oh wow, that, that was impressive. Didn't think he would, he would be able to accomplish that. So if he can keep building on that, I mean, by the end of the season right now, it's Kasha and Silverberg who are kind of clearly the the top two right wingers, but Troy Terry is definitely making a case and he's also getting power play time. So he's, he is established in that way. And, the improvement for him is going to have to come defensively, but he's looking really good so yeah, far. Yeah, I, I think the thing with Terry that that's so noticeable is his neutral zone play. I think more so than mm-hmm. anything else, that's the thing that has impressed me the most uh, over these last, uh, or specifically in tonight's game. There were a couple times where he just did a couple little toe drags coming out of the D zone at the at his own blue line that mm-hmm. it kind of looked like nothing, but it's a gutsy play, and it's it's well, a confident the- play. Well, the thing with Terry is I honestly can't get over how different he looks now from how he looked last year. Oh, yeah, he 100%. The player that we saw at the beginning of last season just was kind of invisible. Yeah. And just wasn't making plays, wasn't really doing much of anything. You saw flashes. I remember th- th- there, were games, there were games where he would have no shot attempts or he would have, like, one shot attempt, and you would just think, what, where, like, you know, where is the skill that I've been told about? And really – 
maybe you, it all comes back to that stint in the AHL where he, yeah. he really lit, lit it up. Ever since then, I just feel like he's a new player, and especially this year working with Dallas Akins, who was the guy who got him that success in San Diego last year. He just looks like a new player, and if he can continue to develop, maybe he makes a guy like Andre Kasha expendable at the end of the day. Yeah. Who knows? Um, On Andre Kasha, that, what did you think of his night? Because we had someone in the Twitch really chat mention. He had a really good game. Two assists, I mean, first star of the night, two primary assists also. So he we led should the probably team mention in individual him. shot attempts as well. So yeah. he's just, I mean, he continues to be a puck hound. He continues to be, I think he, him and Getzlaff, I mean, outside of that goal, obviously with the stretch pass that led to Getzlaff's goal, I thought that Kasha and Getzlaff seemed a lot more in sync tonight. Yeah. And those two just work really well together. And I think, I think maybe Kasha's rubbing off on Getzlaff a little bit because Getzlaff's play, I thought, along the wall in those battle-type situations, he just looked a lot stronger. He looked a lot speedier than we've seen in recent years where, you know, if he if he loses the puck or if he turns it over or he's just, the, you know, the play's kind of over. I, I saw a lot more just kind of combativeness in his game tonight, mm-hmm. and maybe that's just – a summer of, of rehabbing, you know, you know, aches and pains, whatever. Yeah. But he, he looks a lot well, better. The the other thing with Kasha that I want to make mention is, yeah, he led the team in uh, shot attempts. Here's the thing. He had eight shot attempts. Six of those were scoring chances. <laughs> he was everywhere. I yeah. mean, he really was everywhere. And that's, that's what you want from him. And I know that people have concerns about his injuries. I, I get that. He is a guy, though, that I would be loath to give up unless the return just made so much sense, so much logical sense. Because when he is in this lineup, when he is at his best, he is a difference maker. And his ceiling, I don't, I just don't really think he'll be a 35 goal type player, even though he does shoot a lot. But he's just a guy who makes lines work. Whoever he plays with, he seems to do well with. So another guy, though, that I did want to talk about who I thought did make his line work at least to the same degree that we saw Sam Steele do it in the game before was Isaac Lindstrom. Uh, Isaac Lindstrom made the team out of training camp. Part of that was Sam Steele being injured. Sam Steele did play in game one, looked good. uh, But then because he was still dealing with the injury that was in the preseason, Lindstrom had to be called back up. And overall, I mean, Lindstrom did nothing to abate what we saw in the preseason where he was thriving with Raquel and Silverberg, their numbers were almost cut and paste tonight from what we saw in the preseason, just above 60% in those metrics that you want to see, like shot attempts and expected goals. And so I don't know. I don't know what to make of that line because is it just that Raquel and Silverberg are so good together that unless you put me or you between the two of them, that they're going to be great, or maybe they would still be great. Just put some beer leaguer between them. But I thought that Isaac Lindstrom did not look at all out of place between the two. And I just wonder, my assumption is that when Sam Steele gets healthy, that he'll just slide back into that spot and Lindstrom goes down. But how do you, what do you make of that situation and that dynamic between Steele and Lindstrom? Because, I mean, at this point, who would you say is the better player, Lindstrom or Steele? I think Sam Steele is undoubtedly the better player. Okay. Um, I mean, I think it's, I think you're right, but I think it's not, I don't think the, the, the gap is that wide between the two. I I think it's pretty wide right now. I don't think it's that okay. close. I, I think part of it is obviously going to be due to those guys um, it, just being so good. But I also think a big part of it is Sam Steele's just a more polished player at this point in time in his career. I think he, he's better offensively than Lundestrom. Maybe Lundestrom is as good in the defensive zone as Sam Steele is, but I think Sam Steele has an extra gear in the offensive zone and in the creative element of the game. Um, yeah, and, that's fair. I, I just think Lindstrom, every time they put him in that role, he just looks really good. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. But yeah, I mean, Sam Steele obviously is more polished, has more offensive upside, and Lindstrom is probably going to spend most of the season in San Diego. But he's he's looking like a good first round pick, which is. Yeah. What you want yeah. when you're picking in that um, range that they got him in. Before we get into questions, there's one other thing I want to make mention about, um, and that is minutes. Because that was something I think that it, it's going to be a focus for us, I think, this year. Is taking a look at the minutes for all the forwards at 5-on-5 five five and looking at how the minutes are divvied up, I think tonight's going to be a slightly weird one simply due to the fact that the Ducks did take a fair amount of penalties. 
But yeah. if you're looking at five on five ice time, and if you're specifically looking at the forward lines, um, or actually, let's just look at forward ice time. Getzloff uh, had the most minutes out of any center um, at 12:33. And then Derek Grant came in next at 12.15, Adam Henrique at 11.37, and Isaac Lundestrom at 11.01. So the range for forwards, and uh, Ricard Raquel had the most minutes out of any forward at 13.16. So the range is from basically three minutes. 10 minutes to 13 minutes. And yeah. due to, like I said, having some special uh, teams play. So um, it, we now have two games where the range of minutes between the top line and the bottom line are it's really not that great. And I think that's important. Great for as in not that high. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, the the sure. difference between the high and the low is not a very large number. And mm -hmm. that I think is a good thing for this team. If they're trying to, uh, if they're trying to really ap apply the pressure, roll four lines, uh, basically play with the speed that they played with tonight. Yeah. It's the only way to do it. I don't think that you can really have just a, a top a set in stone top top line and then a second line you really need to roll bodies throughout the game and that's what they've been doing and that's what they're going to have to continue to do if you look at the overall ice time though i mean hampus linholm and josh manson both above 23 minutes of ice time and then after that you know pretty big drop off with fowler and Gooley up just above 18 so linholm and manson they're they're the workhorses on this team they're going to be that all season long and like we've said a bunch of times, that's probably the way to go about it. Yep. All right. So I think it's time to get into some questions. So for those of you watching the recorded version of this on YouTube or listening to the recorded version of this on your favorite podcast service, and yes, we do have uh, videos on YouTube. If you want to go subscribe to the channel there, like the video, comment there. We'll, we'll read the comments, kind of go through it. And we actually have something at the end of the show that we want to briefly mention that came from a YouTube comment. But um, we do a Twitch stream of the show each and every uh, game. And basically, it's a way for you to watch us live, interact with us live, because after each and every Ducks game, we do this post-game show. And you can also support us there in a way that's completely free to you if you have Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, you do have Twitch Prime. And with Twitch Prime, you can basically subscribe to your favorite uh, Twitch streamer out there each and every month. You do have to hit that subscribe button after 30 days. And it really helps it a lot. And with that Twitch subscription or Twitch Prime subscription, you get a special badge next to your name, special emotes in the chat. And it, it's a really good time. And when there are a lot of questions, which we've actually got a fair amount tonight, we will prioritize the questions from uh, Twitch Prime uh, subscribers to our show. And I do want to make mention, and this is something I'm going to try to do a little bit more this year, but just reading out the, the couple people that have subscribed to the show, um basically during this show. And so we have John underscore J, Pa Blackhawk, JJ Stone 22, Ken Pafu, uh, Almighty Peppa, Lockdown Late Night, and Craig Pinwhistle all have uh, subscribed or resubscribed to the show uh, during this current uh, stream. And so thank you so much to all of the new subscribers out there, the returning ones like Ken Pafu and Lockdown Late Night. Um, it really does mean a lot. So Let's get into some questions. First one's from Monkey one said, when do we start worrying about the line times being a problem? I don't think that if this is how they're doing it, I don't think it's ever a problem. No, I, I think that this is what you want. Maybe something that you would worry about is if in the playoffs, it's still, you know, there is going to be a point in time when you do need your best players out there, right? Where maybe you just want to focus some ice time on those top guys, but that's, really in a very specific scenario which we will see if they even get to that point i think for the regular season rolling four lines is the way to go and, and i don't i don't see this really becoming an issue yep um let's see uh safe shane asks we saw two different gets lost in the last two games one at and then a really good one tonight would you take that over a season span one off game and one good game um i mean it's a tough question to answer i think that with ryan gets right now they're really managing his minutes in a way that they haven't been in the past. And so I think that we are going to see more consistent performances because he's, he's looking more active physically in the games mm -hmm. where, la you know, last year, and I'm not trying to say that he wasn't trying or anything like that, but you just saw that if he didn't have the puck on his stick or wasn't the offensive zone, he just wasn't as involved in the play. But now he's, he's really kind of ratcheting that up 
in, in all three zones. And I think that's a product of, like I said earlier, him maybe rehabbing some nagging stuff and also just a new system that kind of encourages uh, all five guys to be involved if you don't have the puck. So yeah. um, we will see. The only thing I will add to this is that if Shane is asking me if from a pure production standpoint, if I'll have one game of him being quiet on the score sheet and one game of him having a goal or an assist, I'll take mm-hmm. that. Um, because I think this team as it's currently built is to have scoring spread around. So mm-hmm. if that means every other game, he has some sort of impact on the score sheet. I think that's going to be a good thing. Um, mm-hmm. Joshua's data said question, and this is just for you. Can we give Felix a moment to gloat about the Habs massive comeback win over the Leafs? two big wins in a day. So, He's uh, teeing you up for it. So seeing as it was asked, I'll, I'll give you the floor. How does it feel? It feels pretty good. Not going to lie, when they were down 4-1, I was not feeling too good. I was feeling pretty depressed. And we're two games in, and I started I asking myself, oh, is this team good enough? Is any of this worth it? And then a bunch of craziness happens, and they end up winning the game. So, yeah, I'm pretty fired up. Uh, Yep. Lewis, uh, our good buddy Lewis, uh, X209 said, question, even with Evander Kane in their lineup, are the Sharks as good as we make them out to be? The Sharks look really bad. I mean, it's the, the Ducks obviously played a really good game tonight, but the, the Sharks played last night, and they looked, there were periods of that game where they looked atrocious against the Vegas Golden Knights, and there is there is something amiss there right now. I don't know mm-hmm. what it really is. It could be a, a variety of things, just fatigue from the last few playoff runs. It could be just, I mean, their goaltending has not been that good, which will always kind of color the the analysis. And also the fact that they've had some roster turnover and that that will affect guys stepping up into new roles and, mm-hmm. and how they will perform. So I'm not, again, we're so early in the season. I'm not ready to write anyone off or proclaim anyone as, as champions, but it's not encouraging what we're seeing out of the Sharks. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. I think it's one of those things where 10 games down the line, we'll be able to look back on this game yeah. and have a better idea of, was it just the Ducks playing well, or is this a thing of maybe the Sharks aren't as good as we're making out to me? But I think it's a little bit too small of a sample size for us to make a, a I, overarching yeah, I, statement I, either way. I, I would say two games is pretty small. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the Sharks, three, but still, still small. Correct. Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, and this is kind of just a rule of thumb for anyone listening. The time where I usually start really judging teams is about 15 to 25 games in. So usually around um, around Thanksgiving time, mm-hmm. you know, late November, October is kind of a wash to me either way. And the games still do matter. But really, November, I feel like is late November is where we start getting a, a better feel for how teams are using their lines, using different players. And yeah. by that, by then we can we can start dishing out the hot takes. Yeah. Um, so, but Blackhawk asks question and we haven't talked about this yet. Surprisingly. Oh, what do you think of the new third jerseys now that you've seen them in action? These are the jerseys. How How have we not talked about this yet so far? How did we make it this far without talking about the jerseys? Oh, they're so good. That is actually, I'm a little shocked. And I think I was meaning to talk about them earlier, but we had to cut into our breaks. Um, well, let, let's, this is a, a better question for you to answer, Jake, since you are actually wearing one I, of them right I now, am. the old I version. Am. So would you buy one of these new jerseys? Yeah. I love the jersey. I love the look. I think it's a great jersey. That's it? Nothing else? What else do I need to say? What else <laughs> is there to say, Felix? I think there's a couple things, a, a couple different ways. I, I just think it's a better, it's obviously pretty much the same, but I do think that it there are little alterations to it that make it look better. I don't know if it was just the TV lighting, but the orange seems a little like a different shade. It's a little darker and a little darker, but also like it's it's a bit more reddish than the one that you're wearing right now, which was a bit a bit lighter. That It's a TV thing. They look the same. It, yeah, they look exactly it's like the, the light same. orange. It, yeah, uh, it, it, it's that's that's a problem. It, it's the same exact orange, and this is a thing with the jersey I'm wearing now. Is when they wore it on TV, it looked, or when they wore it on TV, it looked kind of like a more reddish color. But see, I actually prefer that. So now that I know that they're not that, <laughs> I'm a little more down. You're, on it. you're off. Also, the the collar is better. The collar is just so much better. It's all black. <laughs> 
as opposed to the one that you're wearing that I mean, hey, I'm not trying to knock what you're currently <laughs> wearing, but just you just happen to be wearing it. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. It's got this weird gold Anaheim written on it, and I just I'm not a fan of that. So anyway, it's a uh... it's a good jersey. I think any time you get a chance to bring bring out the Mighty Ducks logo, you always got to take it. Yeah. Um. By the way, I do want to shout out to you, uh, Darrell26. Uh, subscribe to us with Twitch Prime, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um. And let's go to this. Uh, our good buddy Bonnie uh, asked, "Did you see that the uh, assistants are permanent? They are permanent. Yes. So um, it's not going to be a rotating cast. It is going to be Silverberg and Manson all season." Yeah, yeah. So I know that they were, I know that Dallas Higgins talked about how they really weren't sure about that yet. And he also did go out of his way to mention that there are other guys on this team who are leaders like Raquel Fowler and Henrique are guys that are leaders, but I guess that they just picked Silverbrig and Manson to be the assistants. And I think that's fine because yeah. Of course, that stuff is largely symbolic, but it also matters, right? It's it's a yeah. bit of both. Yeah. And I think and I think that there are teams where you know that a certain guy is a leader, letter or not, on his chest. You know that that's just a veteran that you can go to that will speak up when things need to be said. And I and I that's kind of how I view Cam Fowler, Adam Henrique. Um, those guys are everyone knows that they're leaders on the team, and so maybe it's a little more important to give a letter to a younger guy or a guy who hasn't had it before, at least permanently and elevate them as leaders, embolden them as leaders because they haven't had that before. So I, I like the way that they've gone about it because it's, it seems like they're trying to bring more guys and, and trying to make them leaders as opposed to just designating, okay, we have these three guys and that's it. I think that it, it, you always want to have as many leaders in the room as possible. That that's the whole goal of leadership. It's not just to have one guy mm-hmm. who's telling everyone else what to do. <laughs> yep. Um, so as we're, we're getting past the hour mark, let's finish off with this question. I know there are some more in here. Thank you so much for putting them all in. But when the Twitch chat's going, like it's going tonight, uh, we're just not going to be able to get to every single question that's asked of us. But thank you so much for everyone that threw questions in. Thank you so much to everyone who's been in the Twitch chat. It's been a good one tonight, but Joshua's data asked question. Realistically speaking, next four road games, what do you think the record's going to be? So, uh, just for reference, they're going to be playing the Red Wings. They're going to be playing the Penguins. Then on a back-to-back after the Penguins, they're going to be playing the Blue Jackets on the ne- very next night. And I, be the, I believe they're playing in Boston after that. Yeah, that's um, that's a tough stretch of games. I mean, the, the Red Wings, you could argue how tough that will be. Mm-hmm. I see them coming back as probably three. or So the last game of the road trip is going to be against uh, the Bruins. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. I realistically see them coming back maybe in those Let's four games. In those four games, what's their record? Oh, just in those four games. Yeah. Okay, that actually that actually simplifies my math. <laughs> um I think they're going to be 2-1 one, and 1 in okay. those four games. You know what? I uh, think that Red Wings and Blue Jackets, I feel pretty confident they're going to win those games. Yeah. I think yep. the Penguins the Penguins just annihilated the Blue, the Blue Jackets and look good and the Bruins are the obviously Blue Jackets. Yes, but I don't know. I just I feel like two one on one is a reasonable expectation yeah, for those four games. The real questionable game for me, I think that they're gonna beat both the Red Wings and the Blue Jackets. Also, they're very mm-hmm. lucky that the Blue Jackets are um are on the back end of the back to back because they're the worst of those two teams. Um and so I think it you, really? you prefer w- worse than the Red Wings? No, they're playing sorry, they're playing the Blue Jackets um the day after that they play the or day after they You're play the Penguins. Okay, got it. Mm-hmm. So not comparing Blue Jackets and Red Wings at all in that situation. Um, so I, I think that the Bruins game most likely will probably be a loss. So it's whether or not they can get points out of that Penguins game. I'm going to go optimistic and optimistic and say they'll go three one and one, or sorry, not three one and one, three and one, three and one. Okay. Yeah, I think two one and one is is where I'll land. I think that we're they're probably going to lose one of the games that we expect them to win. Probably. And get points out of a game we don't expect them to because that's how this weird sport works. Um, Okay, so before we go ahead here and kind of wrap things up, there is something that I wanted to bring up. After our last episode, um, at the end of the last episode, we talked about the 21st Duck program that the Ducks have um, started up, you know, the last few years here and how they've continued it 
this season and how we thought it was really awesome. And we actually got a great comment on YouTube. So definitely if you haven't, uh, or if you didn't know, and you're a YouTube person, you can listen to our podcast on YouTube as well. We basically upload the broadcast of Twitch, but Mark Bertrand left a really nice comment, which I definitely want to read out loud here on the show. He said, uh, you guys mentioned the 21st deck this year and hockey being more than just a game. My wife, Anna Marie, was born with the same condition as that girl, anthrogyphosis, gyphosis. She spent most of her childhood in the hospital having surgery after surgery. She still has both her legs and can walk with special leg braces and hand canes, but mostly uses a wheelchair. She is an amazing wife and social worker who just won an award at her work for her work ethic and inspiring qualities. Hockey is more than just a game. It's a platform to promote ideas to the world. I love that the Ducks are promoting stories like these girls. Hope, hard work, and never give up. I'm so proud to be a Ducks fan and proud to be married to such an amazing person. If you guys can give a shout out to Anna Marie on the next pod, she would love that. She loves hockey and is a diehard Leafs fan. So that was such a brilliant comment and we're happy to chip in in this small, teeny tiny way that we yep. can. But big shout out to Anna Marie. Big shout out to Mark for the comment. And um, it's just it makes us it makes us feel good that we can, you know, lighten lighten the mood any way that we can. Ultimately that's that's yeah. the goal here. And I think it's very humbling about the the community, the reach, all all the listenership and kind of the overall hockey community, the overall Ducks community. And so um, big shout out to Ma- Mark, big shout out to Anna Marie. Um, and thank you yeah. so much for listening to the show. And hopefully and, you can uh, bring a, a bit of joy to your life. Yeah, and congrats on the uh, congrats on the award at work for the work yes. ethic and inspiring qualities. I too want to be inspiring at work. So there's a, there's a role model to look yes. up to. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, did you want to talk about the Twitch stream or the Patreon drive? Uh, Which one did you let's want to go, go to this real quick. So let, let mm-hmm. we'll go to this, then we can go to the Patreon drive. So we got a new mm-hmm. Apple Podcast review um, on Thursday slash Friday. So I did want to mention it. So for those of you out there, if you want to support the show and in a way that um, is completely free to you, if you don't have the the means to do Patreon or you don't uh, have Amazon Prime, so you don't you can't pitch in with Twitch Prime. Another way you can do it is by subscribing us, uh, subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts and liking or sorry, rating or reviewing the show on there. So we got a new one on there. Uh, five star change my ducks experience is the subject from Christoph uh, CA88. And the review said, as a fan of the Ducks since their inaugural season, I stumbled upon your podcast during the summer of 2018, have listened to every episode since, and your show has transformed in a really good way, uh, in a really good way, how I experienced my favorite hockey team. Looking forward to another season of your insights and commentary when the puck drops tonight, because this comment was given on Thursday, uh, to begin a new season of hockey. Great pod. Thank you. So yes. like, like Jake mentioned with the, Apple podcast reviews. This is something that we're going to give you a bunch of different ways to support the show. But like Jake was saying, if, if money is an issue or you just, that's not how you roll, um, then an easy free one that you never have to do again is just leaving a a review. We really do appreciate reading those. It gives us a lot of motivation Mm -hmm. to, to keep this thing going. And it's just great to hear from you guys. I think knowing how things are going is always the way to maintain a good show or improve it if it needs to be improved. Now let's get into the Patreon drive though. So as we've already talked about on the last couple episodes, we're trying to grow the show this year and offer you uh, just a bunch of different avenues to support us, but most importantly provide avenues that will actually benefit you directly in in the way of additional podcasts, uh, events. And so through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash AC pod, currently we offer two, levels of uh, patronage so at a dollar a month you basically just show your support and you get to have access to an exclusive discord chat so when there's breaking news or something's going on with the ducks we can just jump in there and interact and it's a lot of fun but at five dollars a month if you want to up your pledge you still get access to the discord chat but in addition you get uh, two bonus episodes a month and these episodes um, include different topics that are definitely going to have some Ducks related elements to them. But of course, we also look at the league wide issues. We look at different teams. We also just go totally off script and have some 
more lighthearted episodes. So it's a lot of fun. Now, however, we're trying to grow that and we're trying to add events and different things that are going to benefit you even further. So Jake, do you want to go over those new things? Yes. And I do want to make mention that some of these are basically once we hit them, they're happening. Some of them um, we'll get to them and we'll just need to stay at that mark to be able to keep doing it. But with this month being our drive month for uh, October, um, if you are currently a patron and you want to up your pledge just for the month, that's one way to help us hit this. The $5 that we have for the bonus episodes, it's not a hard $5. You can go above that if you would like. Um, but if you want to pitch in however however much you can, you can also do it that way. And just uh, if you want to help us hit these goals for the month, you can just do it for October and then bounce out afterwards. But so for the goals, we currently are at $274. And if we hit 350, we'll host a Patreon exclusive watch party. Some people in the Twitch chat they can definitely say um, they're a good time because we we did one last year. And pictures of beers will be on us. And then the next goal will be at 500, which means we'll host a page a live Patreon exclusive show. And so this would be a live show for patrons um, where they can come. It's basically kind of be kind of going to be like a watch party, but we're also going to do a podcast in front of all of you, so you can see us in person as compared to watching us on the Twitch stream. And mm -hmm. at 750, this is the big one. We're going to add a bon another bonus episode. So instead of two bonus episodes a month, we're going to bump it up to three. And then at 1,000, we'll do another watch party. And on top of that, we're going to do a live show right after the watch party. And so it's gonna the watch party will be during a game on a live post-game show directly after that. And the other big one is at 1,500. We're going to add another bonus episode on top of that. So we'll get up to four a month. So it, it's going to be a good time. Some of these are a little bit lofty, and we understand that. But, you know, let's set our, uh, our heights high. Let, let's, let's go up high. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So once again, that's at patreon.com slash AC pod. And the link to that will be in the description of the podcast. Speaking of the podcast, places that you can find it, like we mentioned already, Apple podcasts, we're also on Stitcher and we are also on Spotify. So if you listen to your music on Spotify, well, there you go. You don't have to go anywhere else. And I think that if you're on Spotify, the podcast also posts a little faster. Something I've noticed. <laughs> it's it's a it's a very marginal difference. Uh, don't be alarmed either way. Uh, but... Bugs you so much. <laughs> of course, you can also find the podcast through our main website, our hosts, AnaheimCalling.com. That's at Anaheim Calling on Twitter. Make sure to check that site out. If you are a diehard Ducks fan, look no further. Um, this will have all of your needs in terms of prospect coverage in terms of game day articles, analysis, and, of course, the podcast. One thing that I forgot to talk about is that uh, Bo Guru signed an entry-level deal with the Ducks. We'll, we'll maybe go a bit more in-depth in that next podcast. And, of course, make sure to check out Jake and I on social media if you want to follow along during games when news breaks. Jake is on Twitter at ReindeerGames91. That's also where he posts his articles. Jake writes a weekly ranking, and the rankings are controversial, they are a little bit out there, but they are also informative. Now, none have actually been written yet this season because <laughs> we're only a weekend. Yes. They will eventually be released. And ne next weekend. Next weekend. I, next weekend. Yeah, exactly. So definitely recommend that you check that out. I am on Twitter at Felix underscore Sicard. That's where you can find all the tweets, of course, and retweeting the podcast. I also do write some articles every week for the third or the third, <laughs> the fourth period at the fourth period. Um, so I have an article coming out usually every Monday on what's going on with the Ducks, just a, an in-depth topic. So on that note, thank you so much for listening, everybody. We really do appreciate it. Really happy that the season is back. Feels like we're, we're really kicking into high gear here. And we will talk to you on Tuesday night after the Ducks take on the Detroit Red Wings. We'll talk to you then. Bye.